Well, hello there. Welcome back to the OMG MotoGP podcast and this our 2023 MotoGP Christmas season review. It's only a week till Christmas or so that we're about to, uh, that we are recording this. Uh, and if you're watching us on our YouTube channel, you can see Keith is very much in with festive cheer, the tree decorated in the background. Um, that is Keith Hewitt. Pete McLaren joins us as well from Crash.net and my name is Harry Benjamin. And where to start for this season as we look back and look a little bit ahead as well to 2024? I suppose, Keith, big picture, first of all, how how do you reflect on 2023 as a whole? I think it all panned out as we expected it to in the end. I mean, it, it, it went through phases, didn't it? The Aprilia <clears throat> in testing early on didn't look like it was going to be a motorbike that worked. Then it did, um, magnificently so. Then it fell away a little bit. KTM made that step that they'd got to make with all their money and their investment into things. Yamaha probably is the poor relation of the entire grid nowadays with Honda very close second to them when it comes to uh, performance during the course of the year. Mark Marquez is back. Um, I think that the Bang Naya jorge Martin battle of the year um, kind of ended up where we might have expected it to, in that Bang Naya just has an extra little bit of maturity to carry it off where it counted. In the main races, the main Sunday races, Bagnaya just seemed to have that kind of edge. How that's all going to shape up for 24? You mentioned 2024. Do you know what? When you said this was a review show and you got a running order for this, Harry, I had to laugh because I, I, I've i kind of forgotten about 23 already. I'm already on 24 because <laughs> there's so much stuff that we've we've got to talk about um, <laughs> pre-Christmas that I'm, I'm really, really looking forward to 2024. I, I mean, Cito Pons, out of a job. The great Cito Pons, former world champion, no longer in employment. His team, he came apart. He was going to go and work for the the RNF cryptocurrency mob, wasn't he? As a, as a, as a some kind of financial um, guru to bring in sponsorship and the like. I mean, Cito Pons out of work. I saw Cito at Mike Trimby's memorial at the RAC club last week. You know, really strange. Strange feeling that a man of his ilk is is out of work. And I think that these are the changes that we're going to have. Mike Trimby, again, you know, Mizano was marked, well, probably for two things, obviously losing Mike on the on the Friday, um, and Danny Pedrosa, a wild card, which is something else that we can, can push forward to 2024. We've got more wild card opportunities coming up next year. Um, they're going to be very exciting as well. I'm sure we'll get into that as we go. But Danny Pedrosa finishing fourth in a race on a KTM just – out of the box. He did two wild cards, I think, last year, and, and, and he was in the points both time around. But the fourth place as a wild card is pretty spectacular considering the company he was keeping. So there's a there's a lot to look forward to as well as back. Pete probably got a better memory than there. me, I've got to say. Come on, Pete. <laughs> fill in the gaps. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, you did a good job of summing it all up there, Keith. But I think, as you say, you know, coming into the year, Banyai was the favourite, wasn't it? I mean, we all thought He's got the championship under his belt now. He's going to pretty much walk away with this. And and to be honest, by the sort of middle of stages, he was looking pretty comfortable, wasn't he? There'd been a few races. You saw Bezeki, Martin sort of tussling with him a bit, but no one really looked like they were threatening him. And then suddenly this, you know, you know the, the, that, that shocking high side in Catalonia combined with Martin getting that setup right on the Pramac bike and just going on that run. And I mean, you know, what a, what a step forward that, that both Martin and Bezeki made compared to last year in terms of the standings. And, uh, you know, you look at it, as you say, the, you know, the wins, they were pretty similar, you know, in terms of wins. I'm talking about Banyaya and uh, Martin. Similar in terms of wins, similar also in terms of mistakes, really, non-scores. The, the difference actually probably just came down to one of those slightly off days or off weekends where they were a little bit below average. Peko delivered. He pulled in the point. The number of weekends, I think, where he got at least 20 points out of 37. So nothing spectacular, but just kept bringing the points home. He did it more than twice as often as uh, as Martin did. And that probably is where the difference was. Martin's been speaking, isn't he? I think he regrets, obviously, Indonesia falling from the lead. You've got things like Australia, all these big moments that capture, you, you know, your attention. But to be honest, those sort of things even themselves out, I think, over the year. And uh, and uh, again, as you said, Keith, the, the Peko deals with the pressure. And, and he was under pressure, wasn't he? Coming in at the end of the year, Mark Marquez even is predicting Martin's going to win this. You know, you had all these people saying, Heko's going to lose this. Heko kept quiet. He dealt with the pressure and he got it done. Question for me would be, um, have we seen, I think Bengnaya, probably we've seen him at his best during the course of the year, the way that he handled the pressure and everything. 
But Magna, uh, but Martin seems to have headroom for me. I mean, he was Mr. Sprint Saturday, wasn't he? Always managed to cover off. I mean, he won more sprints than anybody. But he, he, he seems to have that extra headroom. He's got that extra step that he can make. Whereas Bagnaia, I think he's at the top of his game and went through the year at the top of his... Yeah, finally. Yeah, they both made mistakes. You're absolutely bang on dead right. And I think next year, the amount of races we've got next year, now that we've got all the data for sprints, we've got all the data for, for the Sunday races, you know, there's going to be quite some changes come the end of 2024. I'm even looking forward to 2025 at the moment from a health and safety position. I I really think that that there is going to be a situation where changes are going to have to happen during the course of next year because I don't believe that we can carry on with the intensity that we've got in Grand Prix. Um, with the loss of Mike Trimby in, in Erta, I don't think any of us, excuse my cold, by the way, if I sound a bit uh, cluttered, um, with the loss of Mike Trimby in Erta, the man that had the power behind the throne, if you like, it's going to turn into more of a committee type situation. The FIM are likely to get more involved. Dorna, what will their influence end up being, I wonder? They're obviously promoters. They're looking to try and build as much financial um, benefit as they can into the series as well. Um, but it's going to be a situation where, as Erta backs away a little bit, <clears throat> possibly from the representation of riders and teams, because that will be the way of things, it will become not such a dictator's um, domain as it would have been with Mike Trimby controlling Erta and forcing things through. I think as it becomes more of a committee, that's when it weakens slightly. It's when the FIM come in more. And suddenly, this new riders union that um, Sylvain Gintoli is trying to put the, the nuts and bolts in place will come into its own. And my belief is that you'll end up with the employment of lawyers. I believe that from a health and safety position, um, if I was if I was running their riders' union, the first thing I would do is go to all the top riders and say, "This is the cash we need to employ a 250 grand lawyer um, to look after our interests of the year." No rider in any riders' union can st stick his head too far above the turret without getting his head blown off. Um, as far as his racing future is concerned, it's too much of a distraction. So you know, I think what we're going to end up with is we're going to have a fourth entity that's going to get involved in the rules. The MSMA, for instance, you know, uh, the Motorcycle Sports Manufacturers Association, um, they have a situation where they make rules and it's got to be unanimous. That's got to change at some stage. So there's, there's going to be some massive, massive changes, uh, whether they happen this winter or whether they happen during the course of 2024, I don't know. But, but, but there are, believe me, some big changes to come in our motorcycle sport from the top end of things because it, it's unsustainable. Um, the way it's headed at the moment with the amount of races you've got. Yeah, injuries. Mate, I've, I've been there myself. The fact is, is you fall off. You see these guys fall off. I mean, 29 times for Mark Marquez this year. 29 crashes. If you fall off your push bike and get a few grazes and a few bumps, you're aching for a week, maybe two. These guys are never fully fit. They've always got something that's either strained, bent, buckled, busted, and that carries through the year with all of these races they've got to do. Add to the fatigue of some of the back-to-backs that they've got again next year. I looked at the schedule. I mean, it's an absolute bloody nightmare. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry if you're not on YouTube because I've just got it up here now. You know, the potential for 23 races next year at the moment. I know there's a couple in there that haven't yet been homologated. But, and, they, and they've got spares. And they've even got Balaton Park there in Hungary as a, as a reserve event just in case one of the others don't make it. You know, you... You know, 24 tracks are on the list for next year, one of them being a reserve. So I think there's some, I don't think everybody's quite realised the amount of aggravation coming in um, in January, February, uh, the realisation of it. Well, you, you mentioned injuries and it, this year was already, you know, the longest season ever. It's going to get longer. And of course, Pete, we had the introduction of sprint races, which Keith's already alluded to. Now, I think, I think on the whole, I mean, from my perspective, I've I've enjoyed the sprint racing. I think it's been a good addition. But you can't look at you can't not look at the fact that there has not been a full grid of of permanent Grand Prix riders for one race this year because of injuries garnered in the sprint. Yeah, exactly, Harry. I think yeah, I agree with you. I think from the the show perspective, the sprints have been great. They've done the job that was intended. But also, and and this comes back to what Keith was just saying, most of the riders. Are, 
when you when you speak to them about the sprints, they would prefer them not to be every weekend. They would prefer to have more like you guys have in Formula One, Harry, where is it what half a dozen maybe or less or yeah, yeah, six. Yeah, I mean, th- I think if it was up to the riders, they would prefer it to be like that. Now, you then open a whole other can of worms, as in which races do you have for those six, et cetera, et cetera. So, and I think most riders accept the sprint races are here to stay. But in an ideal world, I think they would prefer them to be sort of a, a speciality event, almost. You know, not not the the week in week out for the reasons that Keith has mentioned. The, the crashes, as you say, I think there were twenty three more over the course of the year. So that's you now it's only one more. This is for MotoGP. That's only one more per round. But of course, a lot more were in races and race race crashes tend to be one rider hitting another and people getting injured, which is why, as you say, Harry, we never had a full grid of, of riders for any race because, uh, you know, the, the number of crashes might not look like more, but instead of a low side in practice, it was two riders colliding in a race, more racing, more accidents, more injuries in that sense. So yeah, th- there's those kind of things that need to be discussed, as Keith said, that the riders will want an input on. Another one might be tire pressures. You know, we saw... You know, towards the end of the year, we saw Digia stripped of that podium at Valencia. You know, I mean, thank goodness MotoGP dodged the nightmare of the title being changed by it. But it did just show what may have happened. You know, Digi was on the podium. He could have been either in front of one of the title contenders or between them. And, and you know, by by penalizing him, that would have changed the points. And, and who knows what might have happened there. So at the moment, there's no warning for next year. You know, if you if you are below the limit, you're out. There is no warning. So, you know, will that change? Will they come up with a, a different system? That's another thing that perhaps the riders and the uh, and all the, the you know the, the stakeholders in MotoGP will need to sort out. I think. And we thought track limits was going to be a problem um, forever, didn't we? Um, track limits seem to have sunk back into the um, background mm-hmm. nowadays and seems to be quite a reasonable situation. I mean, if you look at the um, MSMA, uh, the new ranking for concessions. I mean, you've got to add the concessions into this as well. Tire pressures, do you know what? That rule just annoys me. I, I, I can understand why it has to be you know, a minimum tire pressure, but it's just it's just one that, that is going to cause us a problem throughout the year. And and for fans at trackside, nobody wants it sorting out in a committee room after we've had the podium, you know, and that's the potential for next year, as you've already alluded to, Pete, that, that you know, if someone is, you know, declared top three, whatever it might be, the position they might be in, and then it's taken away because of a tyre pressure, you know, where they've been one lap wrong, under under pumped, um, then you've got a problem. But the the next year's concessions, it's a real problem for the MSMA to have agreed this, really, when you think about it, because it has to be a unanimous decision at the end of the day. And the, the concessions that Honda have got, because it's based on how we start this off for next year, it's based on the points available um, from last year. So who scored... Um, what? Um, and if you're in the lowest 35%, you are in rank D, which is where Honda and Yamaha are, which gives them, depending on how many races we end up with next year, nine or 10 engines for the first time. Um, you haven't had that for a long time. Engine spec is free. So you can do what you like. So if you're in this category D, these are massive concessions to Honda and Yamaha um, as they start the year. It resets halfway through the season, and again at the end of the year, obviously. So you can have concessions into the first half of the year, but you might not have some of them for the second half of the year. Um, it's slightly confusing to to make a commentary over at this point, but once we get it up on graphics and stuff like that for people to see, um, it, it might be something that is slightly more understandable. Private testing is free for the bottom 35%. These are big concessions for Honda to come back uh, into the fray. I don't feel Yamaha will be able to take advantage of it. I just don't think Yamaha are far enough forward to be able to make this work for them. But certainly for Honda, these are big concessions that, that, that could, you know, they're allowed two aero updates during the course of the year as well. Another massive thing. Um, everybody's still bickering over over ride height adjustments and, and, and so on and so forth. Nobody wants them. But, but of course, Ducati, um, to, to get rid of them, you got to get Ducati on side, as the rules are at the moment. Pete, I mean, my understanding is the Grand Prix Commission, GPC, FIM, Dorna, Erta, and the MSMA. Now they're the the four, and I think Dorna have a, a casting vote if there's a if there's a, 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 a an equal disagreement. But the FIM, Dorna, Erta, and the MSMA that makes up the Grand Prix Commission, and they basically can, I think, 
pretty much overrule the MSMA in individual. If they want to make, they could change the unanimous rulemaking decision of the MSMA. Now, it would be contentious, um, but I believe they can do that and should do that. I think that there's there's issues such as is it a safety, you know, a, ch a safety change that could be introduced. Normally, I think what happens is that the FIM and ERTA vote with Dorna. So although you've got the four members, as you say there, Keith, in effect, you've got the MSMA and then you've got Dorna and, and ERTA and FIM will vote with what Dorna go with. That in reality seems to be what happens. So if you've got a split there, you end up with three to one, if you like. Um, so, but, but normally the idea is that the manufacturers, if it's a technical issue, it's left to them to thrash it out. And it's only in sort of extreme circumstances and safety is the, the thing that's brought up. That, that someone will overrule the manufacturers. That, that's but at the moment, the idea with, with this unanimous, all manufacturers, all six must agree on something. It means that there's always that right of veto by any one particular team. And at the moment, Ducati, because they've got such an advantage. I mean, we've got ECU changes next year as well, which, which could, could make some difference too. But the point is, it's, it, the sport is being held back by this unanimous rule, in my view. Yeah, you know, we we're... We, or, or you could argue the other side of that, you know, by by having to agree everything that the sport or the manufacturers or the motorcycles being developed are being developed to the nth degree. But is that good for the sport? This unanimous thing. I mean, for example, let's take the concessions. Now, Ducati, they've said, look, they, they were happy to give Honda and Yamaha these, these extra concessions because they accept that they need, for whatever reason, they need the opportunity to catch up. But, they weren't happy about KTM and Aprilia, in effect, getting more, was it more testing tires uh, than they have, uh, the, and more wild cards, you know, the, the sort of the C ranking, isn't it, that, that KTM and Aprilia are in. And, and Gigi was asked, well, why did you agree with it? It says it's unanimous. And he said, well, because in the end, you know, we all have to reach an agreement. So although you get this statement that things are unanimous, it doesn't actually mean that they all agree as such. But if, if it is one manufacturer you know, maybe isolated. Sometimes they will hold their ground and say, no, we're not changing things. Other times they, they could sort of be persuaded to, to continue. But yeah, on the concessions point, yeah, uh, that there's various views on this. I mean, Jack Miller, for example, was saying, well, hang on, Honda won a Grand Prix this year. KTM didn't, which is true. I mean, KTM, they won a couple of sprint races, didn't they? But they didn't win a Grand Prix. Rins won a Grand Prix for Honda. Now, obviously, as you as you made clear, Keith, the the, the the system is changing. It's now going to be about constructors' points, not about podiums and wins, which was the old system. But you know, so the, the point being, though, there's various people in in factories going, "Well, hang on, why are they getting that? Why are they getting that?" Um, it's a tricky one. I think. I think in the end, what they want is that. I mean, Ducati got what 96 percent, I think, of the potential constructors' points. That's why they're in ranking A. I mean, 96 percent. And the aim, I think, will be that everybody will sort of settle in bands B or C. That, that to me, is it. So the guys in D, which is uh, Yamaha and Honda, they get all of the concessions, all the big perks. They will eventually move up to at least C. I think that's the aim. And Ducati will drop to at least B. I think that's what MotoGP is aiming for here. So you'll effectively have all of the manufacturers. The only difference between them will be number of testing tires and number of wild cards. I, I think that's what they're aiming. Now, whether that's going to happen, I don't know. Interesting that you touched on KTM there as well, because KTM was shut. The door was slammed in their face regarding extra grid slots. And I think that that was, that was, that was to try and keep Mark Marquez from jumping ship to KTM at one point. I think that was almost a Honda protection type scheme in that um, suddenly there was an opportunity across there. Would Mark have jumped to KTM? He's, he's obviously jumped in the end anyway to, to Ducati. But, but the point being, you just... Can't always be sure about what is going on behind those um, gilded desks. I've, I've got to say, sorry. I, I, yeah, I've got to say, I don't understand that. You know, KTM offering, you know, the budget would have been a well budgeted team. Aki Ayo, we know, experienced guy, team manager, Motor 2, multiple champions in Motor 2, aren't they? I mean, I, I don't understand that. I mean, what would the, what harm would there have been? I know there's the, the system, the grid slots, and you're not supposed to have extra independent teams. That was the grounds on which it was turned down. But you do just think bigger picture. You know, someone should have stepped back and said the two more competitive bikes, two more riders that we could have had on the grid as well. I, I think it was a missed opportunity. And and, and I I think I think there's been some words from Pit Byra that the KTM were kind of taken a bit of back by that that they you know were turned down given all this the input that they put into Grand Prix, you know, the Rookies Cup, they're in Moto3, they're in Moto2, they're in MotoGP, 
and yet they can't get two more places on the grid. Was it also to sort of not scare off more, you know, Yamaha and Honda, Japanese manufacturers, you know, if another yes. team suddenly comes in that's that's not a Japanese manufacturer, suddenly starts doing better than the factory Yamahas and Hondas, then suddenly, uh-oh, Dorna have got another Suzuki on their hands. Well, I think that um, Dorna are managing it in the way that they see it at the time that they see it as we move forward. There's always something that's that's um, that we don't know about that they're, that they're, they're operating towards or they're trying to appease in some way shape or form but i think pete's right it's a missed opportunity i think we've said that all the way through the year uh, regarding ktm it would have been a, a, a good thing but i mean I, I i i actually if we take a vote on it between the three of us i like these concession rules we it, something had to be done and i mean honda and yamaha so manufacturers points they've, they've got to be the lowest 35 percent um gives them 260 test tires compared with the two, the 170 that you get as a as a, a ranked A team, you've got private testing. It's free if you're in category D. GP circuit testing. You're only allowed three circuits for A, B, and C ranking, but you can have any GP circuit if you're in D. That's quite a big one. Wild cards. You're allowed six for categories D and C. Engines, an extra couple of motors, which is always going to be a good thing. An engine spec. That's the crucial one for me is free as long as you're in the lower uh, category um, D ranking. Some quite but Keith, big... coming back to your your words about the calendar, sorry, when will they have time to test? Good point. I mean, I mean imagine, you could, presumably will have to be on the Monday after a race, won't it? But still, you know, as if the Honda and Yamaha riders are not facing a big enough season as it is, they're now going to have to do private testing sandwiched in somewhere, um, you know, during the year. Obviously, they'll be at the Sepang Shakedown. That that's a no-brainer. I think all you know, so all the Honda guys, all the Yamaha guys, will be there. That one makes sense. But once the racing gets going, I mean, I, I think it would have to be the Monday. It's the only way that they could possibly I'll tell you what, fit in any time. The summer break is going to be a busy one this year. That's for sure. For some ride, if they've not got that, if they've not jumped out of Category D by the time we get to the summer break, where where again, the, the pretty much the cutoff point is the half season part of it, where concessions change again. Um, it's going to be a busy year for some. There's no doubt about it. I, I've, I've, I've said this before. I, I mean, maybe we're going to end up going the NASCAR way with, um, with, with, with two or three teams. Um, NASCAR is so busy in America. Anybody that follows car stuff will know what I'm talking about. And, and bearing in mind, we've got a NASCAR team coming into uh, MotoGP soon anyway. So that the link there, sorry, everyone apologizing for bringing the car stuff in. But the, the fact of the matter is, is that we've got a NASCAR team coming in anyway. Um, so they'll be familiar with, this leapfrogging of, of teams and riders and equipment as they go through the season. There's some 40-odd races in a NASCAR season, and there's just no time to breathe in between. So they they they, they piggyback, leapfrog, should I say, not piggyback, but they leapfrog each other around the United States to keep the whole thing rolling. <laughs> and with the amount of work that these guys have got to do in MotoGP coming up, we might well be seeing a bit more of that. There is clearly a lot of work to do, uh, especially for for the Japanese manufacturers. I do want to come on a bit more. We, we've spoken about them already. KTM, because I, look, I think back to our 2023 season preview way back when, and I don't think any of us thought anything of KTM. In fact, they looked like they were in trouble. And then what a turnaround pretty much from from the start unless we all just read testing wrong but ktm especially for brad binder on the bike as well a very well a decent year for them jack miller with some struggles but ktm from where they were in pre-season testing i think they've got to look back at 2023 and go well actually you know it could have been a lot testing worse. is quite often about chucking stuff away as much as it is finding stuff that works it's about eliminating the things that you think you're going in a direction um and you discard those ideas as you move forward and, and you focus where you are going to be strongest. And I think maybe we were fooled a little bit by Aprilia and a little bit by KTM in the early season part um, because they had changes in the pipeline and they just needed to dispense with all the, all the stuff that they perhaps hadn't quite worked their way through. Um, and maybe that's what fooled a lot of us underly clever in, in, in fairness Keith I, I asked Brad Binder about this you know they were worried you know in pre-season testing they they came away from the Sepang test also thinking what we were all thinking you know whoa we're, we're in trouble here so I think 
we weren't fooled in terms of of where they were. We were all surprised by how quickly they fixed it all. I think that's that's what 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 happened. But yeah, I think I think they've gone on record multiple times. Uh, the team managers as well as saying, you know, no, we we were in trouble during the winter, but yeah, they they turned it around in some sort of speed and then kept that development going, didn't they? Who'd have thought they would have introduced a carbon fiber frame halfway through the year that worked. and it would instantly, yeah, insta exactly, keep instantly work. I mean, so so yeah, I mean, they had the consistency, didn't they? They 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 needed that consistency. It was the one thing they'd been lacking, wasn't it? They'd always been able to win a race or two. Okay, they didn't win a Grand Prix this year. They they won some sprints. Should have won Valencia, of course, but. Um, but they got that consistency and, uh, you know, improvements in qualifying as well, which maybe Jack Miller helped with. He bought some new ideas from Ducati, new ways, uh, him, his crew chief, and, uh, uh, you, know, you know, the other guys have moved across from Ducati. All of that input, I think, has just made the, the KTM a more refined package. And uh, for, for me, the Aprilia, I mean, it wasn't a disaster, was it? it? They were about where they were last year. They were third in the constructors. They were third this year. Bear in mind, it was their first year without concessions. We've seen quite a lot of factories drop away, haven't we? Or really struggle. I mean, they at least managed to hold their position without having all of those things, or, or most of those things you read out previously, Keith, for the concessions that they, they had under the old system. They managed to sort of hold their level. They won two races. They won one the year before. They won a sprint. Um, but they, they weren't consistent, and they had that up and down. But, uh, um, you know, not a disaster for Aprilia, but I think they came into the year with big expectations and you could feel the the, the, the frustration in the early rounds when they weren't taking on Ducati. I think they really thought they could come into this year, fight Ducati and that they, they put too much, you know, expectation on the early rounds when it was a massively long season. If they'd have just concentrated on you know, making the most of those, the points in the first half, they'd have been in a much better position in the second because they did. You know they did move up the order. They, uh, you know, they weren't too far away from the top top three or four places in the championship. Well, I think you've you've there's two things in there, isn't there? The, the KTM situation had Danny Pedrosa. Danny Pedrosa as a wild card. Danny Pedrosa as, as a test rider was an absolute asset for KTM and moved them in the right direction. There's no doubt in my mind about that. And Aprilia, you're right. Halfway through the season, I mean British Grand Prix. Uh, I, I mean, I've got that marked off as one of my favourite races of the year if not the favourite race of the year, Alicia Spargro pinching it off Benaya on the last lap at the British Grand Prix on an Aprilia was pretty damn spectacular. Um, and you've got to say, at that point, they were definitely on the ramp. You know, that, but they were title challengers at that point in the season. Um, so I would say Aprilia probably ended their year with a, with a major disappointment. Maybe KTM, I mean, you're right, when you said should have won Valencia. Jack Miller, I was rooting for Jack Miller to make that comeback because he's had a really horrible time in the last few rounds and and to come back and then he goes and dumps it you can't blame a man for trying by the way and i never would do but the the point being is that that, that was theirs for the taking of valencia oh, well i mean yeah ktm good turnaround from pre-season testing aprilia i think left wanting more for certain but then again they did get two grand prix wins um and ktm nada um there are a lot of changes uh, for next season, uh, particularly, though, uh, a few around who is on what bike. And, of course, in 2023, we bid goodbye to Paul Spargro. Of course, changes for Mark Marquez. We've covered that left, right and centre. But also right at the very end, we got confirmation of uh, Fabio Di Antonio and Luca Marini. Uh moving to their respective bikes. Let's not forget Zarco, Rins, Morbidelli, all changing bikes. Keith, maybe I should put, apart from Mark Marquez, which move is getting you excited for next year? What are you hoping to see? I think it's Marini. Hmm? I think the HRC thing. I think that, the, the, you know, like he was at he was at the bottom end of the pecking order at Ducati, wasn't he? So the, the move really, and he will have, I again, forgive me, Formula One analogy. When our good British rider, driver, um, Lewis Hamilton moved across to Mercedes. Everybody went, what? Because at that point, it wasn't competitive. Um, and so we might have a bit of a Lewis Hamilton moment here. If that Honda, and it looked quite good at the test of Valencia. I know that the Honda went quite good at, at Valencia anyway for the final round. But it looked quite good in testing. And if they have come up and they've got these concessions and all the extra bits they need to move it forward, you now Honda really, really, they obviously still want it. And look, Marini could find himself in a, a situation where it was the best move of the year. 
And that's the one that I'm focused on at the moment. I think Marini has shown, you know, is he anywhere near as good as some of the top riders? No, not yet. Does he have a bit of, does he have headroom? Does he have a, a step to make? Yes, he probably does. Will he be able to make it? We'll find out fairly soon. I'd have said he was a bit more Bangnaya than, than Mar- Marquez, his bro- uh, you know, or, or, or not even like his brother, actually, when I think about it. Well, he's not even like Valentino. But he's got some good people in his corner. I think it's also what we need to look at. We've, seen, we've, we've all talked about rider changes, but I think crew chief changes are critical. And we've seen a real shuffle of the pack regarding crew chiefs as well during the course of this year. So a lot of early work for a lot of people, you know, like we're yabbering on in our spare time before Christmas and ready to get fat and drunk, um, where those guys are going to be absolutely pouring over data and look at, you know, the work that's going on right now while we're yabbering on uh, is immense. It's enormous. You know, and in between the the shows and the and the presentations, we just had the big Ducati blast and, and so on and so forth. Behind all that facade is a lot of hard work going on back in the data departments, trying to disseminate everything that's 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 gone on during the course of the year. So Marini's Marini's the one to watch. Honda are the ones to watch. They've got the concessions. They've got the extra tires. They've got the extra engines. Um, they've got carte blanche track wise that they can go to to go and play with because they're in that that rank D uh, for concessions next year. And I don't think, I, I can't see Yamaha being able to maximise their position in the same way that Honda will. Um, it's a feeling. I mean, I would be massively happy to be wrong because this could be the first year for some time that Yamaha haven't been able to to come up with at least something. Um, but I can't see it. I've, I've, I've got no wind of anything that's that's on the cards anywhere. Um I don't know what you feel, Pete, from where you're sat and the way you've been looking in, but the MR looked the weakest for me for next year. Certainly off the Valencia test, Cotteraro, I mean, I mean, he's been realistic about his chances anyway, isn't he? He's saying he wants to be closer for next year. He knows it would be too much to say, you know, I want to jump from where we are now to fighting for the championship, bearing in mind they didn't win a race this year. When was the last time that happened? 2003. So, you know, that's that's where they are at the moment. So there's a there's some big improvements to make there. Uh, I'm interested to see how Rins will go. I think talking of moves, you know, how will he adapt to the Yamaha? There's obviously the comparison with the Suzuki, the inline four engine. Although Rins was saying, look, to be honest, it's more about the aero these days. That's that's what makes the feeling of the bike different for him, as much as uh, as the configuration of the engine. But uh, yeah, I think I think uh, Marini, as you say, Keith, I think he's he's he's, he's in he's in the Honda at the right time. You know, the pressure is off now, and. Uh, but at the same time, there's going to be a lot of resources thrown in. There's the whole concessions thing, which we just brought out and uh, brought up. And he's he's your guy for that. You know, Marini loves the technical side of things. And I think, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm really interested to see what he can do in that position of having a whole factory behind him. Uh, I think I actually asked him about Mizano. I said, because everyone knows how much he loves the technical side of things. He's been on a year old bike with no new parts on it. I said, you know, do you ever kind of get a bit frustrated that you don't get anything new to, to try? And he said, well, that's, that's what that's what your life is when you're a satellite rider. You know, he accepted it, but now he is getting this factory chance, and I think it's uh, it's going to be interesting to see. But uh, you know, on the other, let's say his former teammate, people like Bez. I mean, I think you know he's been getting better and better, hasn't he? Big step forward in the in the rider standing this year. Obviously overshadowed by Martin, but uh, he's made a big step up. You you talked about Martin. Where will he go for next year? The headroom he's got. I think Bez is another one with that headroom. And another one of those riders who's going to be fighting for that factory Ducati seat for 2024, isn't he? Uh, you know, they've got a queue of riders there, as KTM will have. I mean, Brad Binder is signed up. So one of those factory KTMs has already gone. So then you've got already Miller and Acosta, who presumably will be in contention for that the second seat at KTM in 2025 20, uh, and beyond, without even bringing in Mar- Marquez and, and, and maybe people like Jorge Martin, who has said, you know, I want to be a factory rider. I want it to be with Ducati, but if it isn't, maybe I'll look around. Mm-hmm. Very, very good point. One of the, a couple of the riders to, to focus on that I suppose we haven't given much attention to in the season overall that I mentioned there that are switching are Zarco and Morbidelli. Now, of course, Zarco, I was reading over the weekend that, uh, you know, if the Honda ride hadn't come about, he was he was thinking of, of hanging up his helmet come the end of the year. And of course, Morbidelli, off the back of a of a struggling couple of seasons, 
he goes to VR46. Do we think this is a, a, a last chance saloon for Morbidelli or, or, or actually was this year fairly, fairly good in comparison to the previous year, Key? Yeah, I think you've got a problem with um, last chance saloons for a lot of people, even yeah. when you're riding well with the amount of talent that's coming up. I mean, when you saw the way that Acosta was drifting the first first day out on a MotoGP bike of Valencia and what he was doing with that motorbike, I mean, I mean, anybody that's raced a motorbike just sat back, well, anybody anywhere, <laughs> just sat back and gone, bloody hell. <laughs> it was it was so impressive to watch that, um, you know, and, I, and I, I, I don't think you've got many laurels to look back on when it comes to MotoGP. It's the top class. We've we've seen contracts that can get broken, and that is a trend that I think we'll see more of. You know, Morbidelli, you know, he he's got to he's got got to come up with the goods now. Um, Zarco, you never bloody know with Zarco. He could be a winner or last place. I mean, he is he is a unique individual. He's but a he unique... is now finally a winner. Yeah. He's... <laughs> He's just a, he's a, just such an unusual, unpredictable character uh, with the nicest manner you could possibly have. He'd be a massive loss to the paddock. But, the, the, you know, he's still got to consistently put it together. I mean, this is about winning championships. It's not about doing the odd sprint race here and there. You've got to, you've got to be in with a chance of winning the championship or at least showing that kind of potential so you can back up the factory guys if, if needs be. Um, we'll see. I mean, again, how quickly will the will the parts filter down? You know, wh- what will be passed across? What what will be beneficial? We're gonna we're gonna find all that out in the fairly early days. But Pete's comment a, mi- a minute ago: Where are they going to find time for this testing? Mm. You know, injury. You're going to be carrying injuries virtually throughout the year. Um, and the last thing you need is a bloody test on a Monday, having given it. Honestly. I, I can't. Ex- I don't think I can explain to anybody. Anybody that's been in any kind of sport, and say Sunday is your peak day, so you get there on the Wednesday. Thursday is press day. Walk the track, run the track, cycle the track, whatever is your your choice. Press conference at five o'clock. <clears throat> All the usual PR rubbish that you've got to do. Um, look at Talk the data from the week before. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I was thinking the scum of the earth. Then bloody media people. Um, Got to, got to do all your, all your bits and pieces. Friday, <clears throat> kick bollock scramble to get your faster time, to get yourself into the qualifying position you need to be in. Saturday, even even bigger day on Saturday because you've got a sprint race as well now. Just when you've got a peak on a Sunday, you're knackered. You've already done a week's work and you're you're suddenly got Sunday and you've got a massively long race. So the last thing you need to be doing is getting up on bloody Monday morning, full of the aches and pains, masseuse and, and whatever it takes to fix you, and, and ride round and round in circles testing something. It's awful. I mean, I, I used to hate testing, and it was something that was fairly minor back in the day. But now, you know, those guys... And the trouble is as well, if you're not right on the very limit, it's a waste of time testing it. You've still got to be giving it a hundred and ten percent. You can't have a ride around and say, "Yeah, that's better. That'll be all right next week." You've got to be over the limit often to make something either work or not work, and and that is a big ask. I always smile at the Valencia test at the end of it. Not only have you come to the yeah. the end of your race weekend, you've come to the end of the year. <laughs> you've done the the FIM awards on the Sunday night down in downtown Valencia, and then you've got to get up. You know, you have a bit of a rest on a Monday for the for the MotoGP guys because they test on the Tuesday. But oh, your Moto3 and Moto2 guys have all got to go straight for it on your Monday. I mean, what a bloody nightmare. Um, but there you go. It's it's well, going to be a tough year. Does that mean there's going to be a lot more um, emphasis on uh, on test riders? I mean, there already is. But for, for next year, you know, th- that becomes an even more crucial. And particularly if there are more riders injured and you never wish an injury. But that means that there might well be more race opportunities for, for riders who haven't got a full time seat. I think when it comes to quality test riders, yes. I think what we've tended to have in the past is is test riders tend to be the guys that have fell off the end of the slope then and they're on the down slope performance wise. Um, I don't think that's going to be the case in the future. We're going to have, they're going to hire top quality, you know, guys that just haven't quite got a MotoGP job to be in the, the test team. Um, you know, maybe the Morbidellis of this world with his experience and his analytical mind would be a good test rider. Personally, I don't think he would be because I don't think that motivates him enough. To be a test rider, motivation to ride beyond the limit is incredibly difficult to do. 
Cal Crutch, though, is a great test rider. Um, in fact, better than... I, I mean, his attention span, I would have said, he's like most riders, is pretty short. Um, but to, And to be a test rider, you know, is annoying sometimes. It's not something you've really got to be in the frame of mind for it. But you've got to give it everything you can to, to produce the best out of whatever you're testing. And that that is a really difficult thing. Big up, Danny Pedrosa. Yeah, I knew that was coming. Uh, <laughs> big up. There might be a, a, a question on Danny Pedrosa later where there is a quiz to round off the show, by the way. So <laughs> I play along quizzes. at home. Play along at home. We're not there yet, though, um, because I want I want to move on and talk about the new team. Uh, but first of all, Pete, just one more word on, on a rider. Um, and we talk about how difficult it was uh, for all the riders this season. But Paul Espargro uh, in particular, a real tough year for him. And it culminates in him losing his ride for 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 2024 yeah you know the the sort of the musical chairs and then we spoke about the ktm this is also why they were trying to get some more grid places because they wanted to keep all five riders if you like with the addition of acosta next year they weren't able to do that and paul ended up being the guy that sort of stepped aside for uh for acosta but uh, as you say i mean there are massive injuries in for paul at round one in uh, in portimao uh, still even at the end of the year he was still physically you know, he was having issues with the hot weather, he was saying, in the way that it would affect the muscles in his shoulders, his neck, and that kind of thing. So let's hope that this, this extra time off, he can get back to 100%. He'll be doing... We don't yet know how they're going to divide the wild cards up between himself and Pedroza. Um, Pedroza hasn't... He's been non-committal on, uh, on how many he would like to do. I think he would like to do more wild cards, but he's also said, look, there has to be a real aim or a goal towards doing the wild cards. The ones this year... For of course, the new race weekend schedule, the sprint races, Danny had no experience of those. Obviously, they were new this year. So he wanted to do wild cards to understand the new weekend format, all that kind of thing. So there was a clear purpose to it. And, uh, you know, he he approached it very seriously. He'd done private testing at Misano before the, the race weekend and everything else. And we all saw how well he went there. Incredible for a rider to just step in like that and fight for a podium. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, we don't know exactly how many wild cards he will do, how many Paul will do. We know there's six in total. Keith was saying from the concessions, so that's how many they're allowed. And uh, yeah, you know, Paul is not closing the the chapter entirely on his full time career, but we've really got to wait and see. I think how he gets on in this new role. You know, does he how he takes to it? How do, you know does he enjoy being a test rider, or does he you know does he want to come back and and be a full time race rider? We know that he was approached, it seems, about the Honda ride, for example. So. Uh, you know, he is valued for the work that he's done. Who wasn't? <laughs> well, that's true. That's true. Uh, <laughs> but, but, but there were a lot of more rumours than there were actual approaches, I think, weren't there? When it, yeah. Uh, yeah. But um, yeah, I think, you know, Paul needs Paul needs some time just to just to heal. for the You know, as Keith's been explaining, the battering anyway that these riders take. And that was the injuries that he had. He's, what, 1.5 centimetres shorter now because of the damage to his spine. Things like that. I mean... It, it, it was a it was a massive accident, and uh, you know, first thing is let's hope he gets fit and healthy, you know, and and let's see how he gets on in this role. It, I mean, we don't know yet. Also, could he be almost like a coach or a mentor with or with a Costa that kind of thing? It's it's all to be determined. How often we'll see him at the racetracks? I mean, he might well be at the races even when he's not doing a wild card, if you like. But uh, he'll still be there often enough, I think. And uh, yeah, looking forward to see what he uh, what he does next year. Absolutely. Well, uh, we wish Paul all the best, uh, but we'll be sure seeing him uh, in the paddock uh, next year. That's the rider stuff. Now, I want to come on to Moto2 and Moto3, but first of all, the last bit to sort of see off this MotoGP Section 1. Um, we've got a new team, as we've already mentioned. In, in a bizarre sort of end-of-year scramble, it seemed, Keith, where just RNF and, and crypto data just seemed to collapse w within hours uh, after lots of speculation them denying it then suddenly it all came to fruition and then super quick suddenly we've got america represented on the moto gp grid and it's from your old stomping ground nascar can you believe it can you believe that i had something to do in nascar that's um, probably yeah. <laughs> that's probably as hard to believe as anything else well i, I mean it, it's interesting isn't it i mean there's two trains of thoughts here I've always liked the kind of constitution of NASCAR, the way that they treat their fans, the way that it's accessible, uh, the the sort of rigmarole, the PR that goes with it. It kind of, it sort of suits motorcycle racing in their thinking, you know, for the fans. It is for the fans. The other side of that is, is that you know, somebody tweeted me and say, 
do we want a load of drunken fans at trackside that only want to see crashes? Um, probably not a bad point when it comes to NASCAR. There's no doubt about that. But I don't think that will be the case in, in MotoGP. Um, but I think American investment is important. And I think Dorna have really, the, the speed of this moved at such a pace because I think Dorna saw the opportunity in that market that's still not very stable. I mean, MotoGP is still not a really stable market, I don't believe, in, in America. And this might be that little fillip they need to, to, to make it a better thing, make it a bigger thing. It, you know, PR-wise, it's, it's already probably got more publicity in, in the States than, than, than we would have if, if Cota was just running as, as per normal. Um, and, you know, will there ever be a two Grand Prix in America? There should be. You know, a place the size of America, we should have two Grand Prix going on there. Um, where that will possibly be, you know, there's another track that's coming up, I think, um, in the next year over there as well, which might be looked in. They've got some great racetracks. It's like British British Championship race racetracks. We've got great racetracks, but none of them are homologated for Grand Prix apart from Donington Park and Silverstone, um, which is a which a terrible shame considering the kind of quality tracks we've got. Who'd like to see a Grand Prix at Brands Hatch? Me, to start with. Um, Cadwell Park <laughs> that would be something a bit no I'd be ridiculous forget about have it a word with Mr. have a word with Mr Palmer <laughs> I do <laughs> good, John, good old JP um, he wouldn't put it on anyway it would cost him too much money he's only interested in the profit side of it rather yeah. than the Grand Prix side of it um, but, but that's another story altogether I don't know I mean it, it's it's going to be a very, very, very interesting year moving forwards. I think that the the RNF thing fell apart. It's a strange thing, isn't it? The way Razlan Razali was the CEO at Sepang International Circuit. Then he was CEO of the new race team, the independent uh, satellite team for Yamaha. What a great start they had in Moto2, Moto3, MotoGP, Patronus sponsorship. I never really got to the bottom of why that died as quick as it did. It was a, it, one minute they were in fully committed Patronus. It's not like they're short of a few quid. Um, and that fell apart at the end of a year very, very quickly. And this cryptocurrency mob from Romania, um, they, they, I mean, the, the, the I, yeah. sort of press. Crypto, crypto data, I think, is different to cryptocurrency, but that's by the by. Well, yeah, I mean, whatever <laughs> it is. I, you know, at the end of the day, I've only ever lost money on it. So, um, yeah. <laughs> So I, I, maybe I needed more data. I needed crypto <laughs> data to look after me. Um, but the point being is, is these guys came in and rumor has it they haven't quite you know, stumped up what they were contracted to stump up financially, which is could be a disaster for Razlan Razali. He's an hour. I mentioned Cito Pons being out of a job. Um, that's a very sad situation. But Razlan Razali appears to be out of any kind of contention for any kind of a team. And it happened very quickly. It must have been deep rooted over a long period of time for Dorna to shut the door, to slam it in their face as quick as they did. Um, it has to be from the very, very top if you're going to kick someone like Crypto Data out in this particular instance. Um, and the Romanians um, aren't very happy that um, they've lost face massively. Um, and that's not a good thing when you're in something like cryptocurrency, I'm led to believe. Yeah, I mean, Pete, what have, what have you heard about it from your end? And obviously, we should say Trackhouse, the name of the team. They, the NASCAR team, they've got some big, heavy movers in there, including, uh, for those of you who are into your uh, your sort of rap pop music, Pitbull uh, is, huh. uh, is, a, is an owner in the team. Rem um, remember the Martin Brundle Pitbull interview on, uh, on the grid? <laughs> I do not. Has he interviewed him? I thought he did. Has he not? Has he not done that at some? Has he stage? not done pit? Well, he's dead. Well, he's done a few like Pitbull, I'm sure. But if we'll have to, we'll have to dig that out of the archive if he's done it. Um, I want an. In I want to see an interview. I want to interview Pitbull next year. <laughs> That's the dream. Um, but and they're keeping the same riders, aren't they, Pete? So they're, they're, they're got contracted. no choice. Yeah, and 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 they're already. It sounds like they're already trying to sign up Aprilia to to supply the bikes long term. I, I think that's yeah. I think that the deal. Is done with Aprilia as well. I think they've the you know the grid places that that was really the moment, wasn't it? There was this cryptic clue from Razan, wasn't it? This post on his Facebook page saying "Last Dance" before the Valencia weekend, which sort of had a few people sort of scratching their heads, and then suddenly, as you say, it just in the space of a few days, there were there were sort of statements going one way and then the other, and then there was this announcement saying the the grid places would not be given to uh, to RNF crypto data for next year, which 
really when you don't when you're a race team and you don't have rid places you don't have anything so at that point it was quite clear that that, that uh, there was something else waiting in the wings and that was this this track house american team and uh yeah it sounds like they, they were already in negotiations but but i think it was obviously accelerated when an, this opportunity arose I, I think that's that's sort of it was almost a, I, won't, I won't say spur of the moment but the opportunity came up when there was the problems with the the raf team and they jumped on it and said now look now's your time if you want to be in motor gp now's your time it's an interesting take keith is talking about trying to break america and how important that is we've seen them try to get the riders haven't we we've seen karen bobia moto 2 joe roberts they haven't quite shown what they need to get another rider into motor gp like you know, obviously, we think of Nicky Hayden, Colin Edwards, Ben Spees, those guys. You know, it's a while back now, but that's really what the sport needs. Now, this is another way of doing it, isn't it? You get an American team in. So that, that'll be interesting, interesting to see if the American fans, you know, gravitate towards MotoGP because they now have a team. Hey, it could be that the next year could be the year MotoGP begins to crack America. Before you know it, it goes all Formula One and we've got three races a year in the United States. It's <laughs> interesting that, that that we saw the same thing with Vision Track, didn't we? I mean, uh, in Moto3, I know, not in MotoGP because the commitment is even bigger in MotoGP. But when Michael Laverty was given the opportunity to put together a team to take the two grid slots uh, in Moto3, it was a similar thing done behind the scenes very, very, very quickly. Michael was given a timescale that you've got to put a team together and put the money together um, or not um, because there is no shortage of people that want grid slots and they are they are the currency in our business. Um, obviously, Aprilia, they were going to be in it anyway. They were already contracted. So, you know, it was just a case of putting this new band and together. The, yeah, yeah, basically. It's amazing I, how quickly something happens when Dorna wants it to. <laughs> I mean, basically, you, you could say it's almost a rebranding. It's a management change, isn't it? The people at the top yeah. are changing. But I'm not quite sure if Wilco Zielenberg is still going to be team manager, but everybody certainly beneath that. I think Wilco's still got to confirm, you know, exactly what the pit management lineup is going to be. But everything beneath that, you'd imagine, is just going to be the same. Be transferred across the bikes. The deal is done with Aprilia for the bikes. Sounds like they might even have 2024 bikes. So that would be a big boost for uh, Oliveira. Well, not, not only Oliveira and Fernandez, but also for Aprilia as a whole to have four bikes, identical bikes, easier to easier to compare the data as well. I hope they don't go the wrong way by thinking that they can reinvent the wheel as a management team. Uh, that, that would worry me hugely. And we've seen it before in these teams where they think they are able to achieve something that isn't perhaps achievable. I think if I was putting money in a team like that, I would be looking to bring in bigger, better crew chief data management names. And there are one or two of them out there at the moment that, are, that I think are still free. Um, and that would be the most prudent way of making sure your team operated in, in the right manner. Um, I mean, even a, a pretty did it with Rivola. You know, we didn't, didn't really know anything about Rivola, but somebody had this brainwave that let's bring him in and from, from Formula One and, and see if his management skills can can bring our team on and it did for Aprilia and I think that that if you if you bring in a bunch of, of Americans that 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 what's the word I'll use the word arrogant but I don't mean it in a de, in a derogatory way I think believing in what you your style of management and your style of getting things done is a kind of arrogance it's a bit like a sportsman a sportsman believes he can be a winner is that a bad thing being that that way arrogant uh, arrogance can be a good thing in your belief, your self-belief. Um, but in this instance, I think that they would be well advised to bring in more names that can put the team together slightly better than it's been before. I think Rosali was running it down a little bit. Um, it needs a little bit more input as far as that's concerned. And perhaps the Americans can just step back just a bit and oversee their investment into into this new team. Davide Brivio. Yes, no longer his formula one jaunt seemed a, a waste of uh time um uh, but not money. from the outside he, he'll have made uh, no he he for him he yeah he did didn't do a lot got paid a lot um but you know for you from from the formula one perspective you know he, he was si he signed with the alpine team and, and they had clearly a, a man with a brilliant knowledge and talent that was not utilized they've now officially parted ways could he be a name that, that comes back into the fold? He's one of the names that was in my mind. Um, 
I don't think you can afford to have the amount of time out that he's had at such a crucial time in MotoGP. So much has changed in MotoGP since he's not been here. It's not that he wouldn't be up to speed on it because I'm, at the end of the day, you're either a bike man or a car man. Sorry, Harry. It, it's a situation where you can't... Yeah, you're the one making more car analogies. <laughs> it's kind of... In, I am, you're right. It's, it's, I, I do because I think... I think the switch, the, the switch over between the two, we can learn from Formula One and we can also ignore the things that they've got wrong. I think you'd be a fool if you didn't pay attention to what goes on in Formula One. It is the biggest motorsport in the world that we all have to accept. So therefore, there are things within Formula One that MotoGP could do with replicating and there's a bloody lot of things in Formula One that we could definitely not do with replicating. But the point being is that I think that... Um, Brivio will have been paying attention to what's going on in the bikes, um, particularly as he's not really been doing much in the cars, it would seem. So he's a, he's a bike guy at the end of the day, and, and, and he came from a very successful background in bikes. I'm sure he would be quite happy to come back in, or maybe not. It's a long, hard season. He's been in Formula One. If he's been at every racetrack in Formula One, it's a long, hard season in Formula One as well. So... Maybe he's of an age where he, he's made enough money and he doesn't want to commit. You know, that, it's a funny thing, isn't it? Commitment is something that you just, it goes without saying for most people. It's not something that you have to, well, I'm fully committed. Anybody that says that, I'd worry about. It's something that's, it's a, you're a doer. You're in it. You're committed to it. It's your life. You breathe it. So, mate, I have a problem in my own house here. They don't believe that I can watch so much bloody motorbikes. Nobody believes it. It's kind of like, but it's in your heart and in your head full time. There's no, there's no escaping it. And I think that that kind of commitment, you know, is what you have to have. It's, a, it's an unconscious commitment and dedication to, to the sport beyond anything else in your life. And I think that once that drifts away from that, it starts to get diluted and you're not performing at your best. Well, let's see what the next few months holds uh, for uh, Trackhouse and uh, how they come together for 2024. Uh, let's just step away from MotoGP for the moment because we can't ignore Moto2 and Moto3. And uh, Pete, let's start with Moto2. Now, of course, already spoken about Pedro Acosta, um, champion ahead of Tony Arbolino, Fermin Aldeguer and Jake Dixon uh, just behind. Um, how do you uh, look back on the Moto2 year? Of course, Acosta, the wonder child from, from the go. We'll, we'll see what he's got next year, finally, in MotoGP. We will indeed, yeah. I, a bit like Banyar, he was the preseason favourite, wasn't he? He was the guy that we expected to, to sort of win the championship. What did he get? Seven wins in the end, which I think is the most since, since uh, Banyar, when he won the title a few years back. Um, so, so a dominant year, but not a record-breaking year. Um, Moto Two as a whole, there was the, the racing wasn't fantastic, was it at times? And I think that's also, you know, when when we all jump on the the wings are bad, the ride height devices are bad, the tire pressure problems in Moto GP. You know, you got Moto Two without any of those things, and the racing wasn't great. So it, it is a complicated thing getting close racing. Is is what it, it's not just as simple as taking some wings off and everyone will be closer again in MotoGP because Moto2 showed that this year, I think. Um, but yeah, Acosta, I mean, he's he's only done three years in Grand Prix, isn't he? He's been champion in two of them. Uh, similar, similar-ish to Joan Mir. He did three years before moving to MotoGP, he did, but he did two in uh, in Moto3 and then one in Moto2, so sort of the opposite way around. But uh, yeah, I mean, everyone believes that, that Acosta is going to be obviously a star. Exactly how big a star is still to be seen. And yeah, uh, of course, Fermi Aldeguer took some of that limelight at the end, didn't he? At the end of the season, uh, so that's uh, <laughs> you know that that sort of took the the shine off a little bit, I think. Um, but um, of course, and then next year, Pirelli tires could be some big changes there. So we'll have to see what happens there. But certainly, this year was Acosta's year, which I think we all expected. Um, and yeah, I mean, good to see Aldeguer the speed ups. Good to see that the Calyx is not completely dominating even though they are obviously, you know, they've won the championship world, we're over 10 years in a row now, I think. So there will be some more. I think Oscar Scura is on the grid next year. Um, a couple more of those bikes, so a bit more variety, let's hope. But uh, yeah, I, I think it was it was the season that we cut, or the champion that we expected. No doubt about it, Acosta, cut above, 
Aldi Gare interfered with him towards the end, but I wonder how much of that was because Acosta's eye had already been taken by MotoGP. Uh, Acosta's first ride out on that thing at Valencia was nothing short of absolutely spectacular. Um, riding style-wise rather than time-wise, I think, is uh, is where I want to go with that one. Um, losing Sam Lowe's to Moto2. This is his last season in Moto2. Goes across to World Superbikes um, for the <laughs> competition between him and his twin brother at World Superbikes. Can't wait for that. Um, uh, actually, uh, uh, we'll be... Um, we'll be Talking with those guys, you two don't know about it yet. Sorry. <laughs> I've got Sam and Alex Lowe's book for February, so um, we will have... Both, have you now? <laughs> both of the Lowe's brothers uh, will be joining us. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> let, me, let, me, let me write that down. Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go. Down the pub. It's another down the pub um, with Sam and Alex Lowe's later on. But they are great kids. Uh, it would be very interesting to see what they've got to say. Um, but that's in February next year. Um, but losing Sam to MotoGP, he will be an asset to World Superbikes. Um, so uh, there's nobody that works harder than Sam and Alex those to, to perform. I talk about dedication and uh, commitment. Those two are absolutely bang on it. Jake Dixon, I feel a bit disappointed for Jake finishing in fourth place. He got third place all sewn up and then uh, basically just slipped away. I know it, <laughs> nothing counts except for a championship win, but believe me, third place is better than fourth place. <laughs> <laughs> like in the obvious. So <laughs> Jake won't be quite so happy with that, I suppose. Uh, disappointments. Ayagura perhaps was a little bit disappointing. Somkat Chantra a little bit disappointing in uh, 2023. I might have expected something a little bit more from them. Uh, Joe Roberts, likewise. The American racing team, I'm a bit cheesed off with anyway because what they've done to R- Rory Skinner, I'm going to keep banging that drum forever because I think they should be ashamed of themselves. Um, <laughs> and that's my thoughts on Moto2. Yeah, fair. <laughs> Fair poor old Rory Skinner. Um Moto three, on the other hand, Pete. Um you mentioned Moto two racing wasn't great, but Moto three always delivers, sometimes a bit too chaotic. Um <laughs> Jama Masia, champion, ahead of Ayumu Suzaki and David Alonso. Um and particularly towards the end of the Moto three season, some some questionable riding. Um but uh, Moto three is Moto three, it's crazy. You're right. Yeah, I mean, the, the, there was what I think ten races in a row where the winner was less than a second or something like that. It, it was, as you say, the opposite of Moto Two in many ways. It was unpredictable, close racing. Messia only four wins to to take the title, but then he was the only Honda rider in the top ten at the end of the year. I, I think if you're KTM, you're going to be sort of scratching your head and say, "How did we lose that one?" Um, it, but but you know that was the nature of how close the racing was. Uh, I think there's a rookie star emerging, as you say, in. Uh, David Alonso, I think he's definitely one to watch for the future, getting several wins in his rookie year like that. Uh, yeah, very impressive. Um, as you say, controversial end. Um, you know, a shame about what went on in Qatar with the teammates getting involved, or teammate getting involved and things like that. But uh, Sasaki at least goes up to Moto2 like like Messia on a high, having got that win eventually at Valencia. Amazing to think he was fighting for the title all the way to the final round without a win. Well, one thing's for certain, I got used to the Colombian national anthem thanks to um, <laughs> David Alonso, uh, which was quite nice, actually. A new national anthem to our um, repertoire that we hadn't heard before, so that's pretty good. Ayumi Sasaki should have won the championship. A um, couple of mistakes cost him dearly. That um, situation in Qatar was just, yeah, that's what cost him in the end. Only six points difference between uh, Jaume Masia and uh, Ayumi Sasaki. So um, I believe Sasaki should have been the world champion. Um, shoulda, woulda, coulda, and he would. <laughs> so there you go. Um, underachievers. No, let's not go with underachievers in Moto3 because they're too young for worrying about that. Colin Veya, I, I think the Dutchman was brilliant. Um, really one to be watching next year as well. Uh, David Munoz, perhaps not quite where he should have been. Anybody else? Joel Kelso was a, a little unlucky as well during the course of the year, perhaps. Romano Fanati seems to, his star has finally fallen, I think, um, which is a shame because I always, even though he was controversial, I always liked having Romano Fanati somewhere on the grid and literally fighting. Um, what else can we say? Dennis Onchu, mm. probably again. Got a few wins. His fourth place underachieving, probably it is for him mm. at this stage in his career. Well, some uh, some prospects to watch out for there next year in Moto3 and Moto2 as well. Um, let's come back to MotoGP then. And who impressed, who disappointed, Keith? 
<sighs> what a year um, to ask me that question. Mm. Um, yeah, I was disappointed with quite a lot of the top runners, to be honest with you. I mean, if, if, we, if we're going to bloody look at the, the, you know, there were quite a lot of people that disappointed me one way and another, you know, giving away points in the way they did. I wouldn't have expected that at this level. You know, Martin did it, Benaya did it, Bezeki was on his way up, so we can't argue with him. Brad Binder, you know, Part Miller is has been a disappointment. And I really hesitate to say that because I love Jack Miller, but he really finished in eleventh place. I mean, he should have won the the final round. You know, if he hadn't been Jack Miller, he might find himself in a difficult contractual position um, with with his season so far. Um, Digi managed to pull it pull it out of the bag at the the end of the year. I mean, he he has to be the greatest improver and saved his MotoGP career. Um, there's not many people that do that in the in the hole that he was in, and uh, to dig his way out on, on a Grassini bike, which is a little bit older, um, and perhaps not quite the motorcycle you need to to win consistently. I mean, I have to say it was a brilliant ride. Bangnaya regained his composure in magnificent way towards the end of the season after he got run over in Catalonia. I mean. That could have been game over for his championship when um, you know he could have easily ended up with a broken leg. I mean, we all thought he did. Cameras stayed on him while he was laying in the middle of the track and clearly in pain. And to be run over by a motorcycle, um, <laughs> any motor, even a Moto Three bike, you wouldn't want it. <laughs> so um, to, to to be able to to fight back from that position, very mature. I'm. I, they know it's a strange one for next year. Has he reached his peak? Is that peak good enough coming what's coming for next year? That's my question. Um, or has he got a little bit more room for improvement? Uh, that's going to be the, the the question mark for, for 2024 for the you know, back-to-back championships. That ain't been done for a long time. You know, if you look at the old record books, you know, Bang Nye are back-to-back. They always say that retaining a world championship is harder than winning one. Pete, I, I, who I impressed? Think... Who disappointed? Just fight, just on the Banyaya thing, I, th- I think if he can just even cancel out some of those mistakes, I mean, he would have had another, what, 20 or 30 points. So I think that there is that bit of room for improvement. Speed-wise, I'm not sure. As you say, you know, can he get any quicker? We'll, we'll see. Um, disappointment was, I think, Marquez. I honestly thought Marquez coming into the year, you know, he's fully fit for the first time since 2020, you know, pre-season 2020. Uh, he was on pole in Portimao. I mean, that's, the, you know, round one, Marquez was on pole position. And, uh, you know, good sprint race. And then, of course, disaster in the in the main race. And it all went downhill from there. So I think that was... You know who all that really affected as well for the whole year, I think? Yeah. Miguel well, Oliveira. Well, it affected him, but it affected Jorge Martin as well. Well, and yes, of course. <laughs> yeah, so, so I'll be, that, that's the standout, I suppose, one for me. Uh, the, 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 the surprises or the feel good, I would go uh, Zarco's win in Australia, uh, Digia winning in, in Qatar. Um, even Aleish actually winning his home race after the, the catastrophic blunder of the year before, you know, to come back from that and win at the track that you know the you know the phrase it's uh, he could used to be at school and could hear the bikes at the racetrack because he lives so close. Rins at Kota, not so much for Rins, but just for LCR. I mean, yeah, yeah, you know, you know they they hadn't been anywhere near competitive like that since Cal left. So just for them to get a uh, a result like that, I think I think those ones would be up there for me. And. Uh... One final thought before we, we finish off with our, our quick quick quiz. Um, you mentioned Banyaya there. Obviously, it was Jorge Martin who who emerged as, as the main contender at the end of the year, not on a factory bike. He even brought some, some unbranded leathers to the final round just in case he got the call up if he won the championship to switch to the factory Ducati. You talk about how much room is there to grow for, for Banyaya, but Keith, how much more can martin do next year not on a factory bike but clearly with with the speed in hand to challenge i think kind of right at the very beginning of this we we talked about Jorge martin he 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 for me has that little bit extra room um for improvement here and there i mean he's clearly fast in sprints um it depends on how he works with his team next year to sort out um his positioning in in the main race on a sunday we are talking about tiny, tiny, tiny amounts of difference now between all of these bikes and all of these riders. It is such a small amount. You know, grabbing a yard here and there is old-fashioned. 
there's not a millimeter to grab here and there on the brakes. You know, you are. It, it stuns me just how close it all is. So he who gets his head around it, and I think Jorge Martin is a very. It's funny, isn't it? In interviews, you would say Jorge Martin was the most confident man out of he and Bagnaya in interviews pre-race. But then you get on the grid and Martin looked more nervous than Bagnaya. Bagnaya always looked a little bit more composed. So I would say that probably Jorge Martin needs to work on his composure a little bit more. Um, those immediate minutes pre-race, you know, the excitement of that, the, the, the rush of blood, you know, we always expect him to be quick in the sprint because that's what it is. It's a it's a balls out bloody half race distance. Don't worry about conserving tires or strategy. It's just get on and go for it. The kind of races we all love. Yeah, it's like club racing, national racing, you know, short races, loads of them. Let's go for it. Um, but of course it's a bit more about getting the twenty five pointer on the Sunday that counts. You know, it's it's being able to make that work. And I think that's where Bang Nye had the advantage this year. I think Maybe for Jorge Martin, where his improvement comes is from maturity, and that comes naturally. Well, I think he's going to be on the, the the same spec bike in theory, isn't he? As, as the factory team again, so that that's a good thing for him. The key thing, though, is going to be: is he going to have that that comfortable setup that he seemed to find, as we say, around Catalonia's time that they just didn't touch? You know, that he was like, right, that's how I like the bike. Don't touch it, and then he just performed, performed, performed every weekend. Will that transfer across to the 24 bike? There's obviously going to be changes with the 24 bike. Gigi's kind of indicated that he thinks there'll be a bigger difference between the 24 and the 23 Ducatis than there was between the 22 and the 23 Ducatis. So that spells a bit of bad news maybe for guys like Marquez Bezecchi, the guys that will be on the year old bike. Um, we've got to wait and see, haven't we? But uh, I think you know, it is going to be interesting to see how he responds to this. Coming so close and losing out at the final round. We saw the tears in the pit box afterwards didn't we but I think you know he's going to have all that confidence of knowing that he can do it that he is fast enough to be a world champion and it's about who else is going to interfere with him who else is going to frustrate that and I think we're going to have a lot more spoilers as the year comes on as well all of those races before as we started the season no one sprint set up race Sunday set up completely different nobody quite knew how that was going to work how it was going to pan out tire wise performance wise qualifying wise they've got all that data now we start with next year everybody's going to be, hopefully, not crashing into each other like Marquez did last year in Portugal at round one. I'm excited for 2024, and it's just around the corner now. So uh, enjoy a little break, but we'll be right back with more MotoGP action. But first of all, before we round out our Christmas special, um, a quiz that I have designed. It's Keith versus Pete. It's five questions, and we'll start with question number one to Keith first. Um, in the event of a tie, there is a tiebreaker. Keith Ewan, 32 riders took part in a MotoGP weekend in 2023. Which rider finished last in the championship? You just broke up right at the point <laughs> for the cross oh, no. of that. <laughs> I'll repeat that, that again. <laughs> yeah, I th- which, rider, <laughs> which rider finished last in in the 2023 championship. <laughs> Don't look. No looking. No looking. It's a, I, I feel sorry for Pete because I've got it all in front of me. No, but don't look at it. <laughs> That's all. I, I, I'm honest when I'm cheating. Oh, well, go on then. Who is it? <laughs> well, it's Alvaro Bautista. Yeah. Well, mm, can I accept that? Why? Because sh- he's because he's not a permanent rider. Well, well, no. I, so I had a different answer. I had um, I had actually technically not classified, but still on the standings, Takumi Takahashi, because he oh, yeah. didn't qualify, but a DNQ <laughs> places him lower wow, you, you... than Alvaro Bautista's seventeenth place. So technically, they're they're kind of joint thirty first, but. A DNQ is worse than a 17th. So I'm afraid, actually, you don't get the point for that. So <laughs> it's it's incorrect. I was looking this for This is Kumi more complicated Takahashi. than tire crashes. <laughs> exactly. Do you Pete. reckon you would have got that, Pete? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> so, see, this wasn't going to be easy. Pete, your question next. Raul Fernandez is the youngest MotoGP rider on the 2023 grid. But 
What year was he born? Oh, oh, uh, so what would he be? Twenty, early twenties. Uh, I'm afraid we can give no help. Twenty, uh, two thousand and three, two. Oh, <laughs> incorrect. Both attempts. <laughs> the year two thousand. Oh, Ralph okay. Fernandez oh, oh. was born. Right, the year two thousand. Right, God, it's been a woeful start. Okay, Keith, back to you. Your favourite man, Danny Pedrosa. How heavy is he? <laughs> and you know what? You can be within two kilograms here. I'm looking for kilograms. I don't have any. I don't have the other measurement. Forty-seven kilos. Fifty-three. Oh, oh. I have to guess. <laughs> I was looking for 51. Ah. So Pete technically is closer. So I'll yeah. bear that in mind. It wasn't if my you question. No, just... It wasn't your question, but I'll bear it in mind if uh, this continues to be a disaster quiz. Um, Pete, back to you. Can you name me the rider furthest down the championship order who won a Grand Prix in 2023? Oh, oh. Rins. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> it's Rins. Well done. We're off the board. Right. Okay. Keith, you need this. You love the circuit Ricardo Tomo in Valencia uh, as the MotoGP season finale. It's well known. So can you tell me how long the track is oh. in, uh, in either kilometers or miles? And you can be within, you know, a few. <laughs> two, 2.2 miles. I'll give you it. 2.4. Oh. I'll give you it though, because I'm feeling because it, it's Christmas. Right. So it it's it goes down to the tiebreaker. Now I need you to to raise your hand first. That's how I know whoever gets this. So it's to right. both of you. And whoever raises their hand first answers the question. Trackhouse racing enters MotoGP next season. An American team. But can you tell me where in America they are based? Keith Ewan, hand raised. It's got to be the Carolinas, isn't it? Can you be a little bit more specific? North Carolina. Incorrect. No. Oh, bastard. Pete, Pete, you, uh, you, have the, you have the option here. Florida? Oh, both incorrect. I was looking for Nashville, Tennessee. Oh. Um, <laughs> so in which case, I'm going to give the quiz to pete mclaren because he was closer for uh daddy, daddy Pedro's Pedro's weight. Yeah. so pete mclaren you win the 2023 moto gp christmas quiz congratulations with, with, one, with one point yeah <laughs> with one point one well, and a half one daddy, and a half danny pedrosa must have more muscles than i thought he had because i based him on my wife's weight <laughs> <laughs> Not that I've ever picked Danny Pedrosa up. I was going to say, did you? <laughs> Not yet. There's still time. Um, well, look, that brings to an end uh, our show. Uh, Pete McLaren, thank you so much uh, from Crash.net. Keith, you're in as always. It's, it's a pleasure to, to chat MotoGP with you. And thank you as well uh, for watching and listening wherever you've been able to find us. People are still refinding us all the time after the old show ended. So please continue to spread the word, to comment, like, share, subscribe. It goes longer than you know um we are going to be back for a show in january and february we've also got our chain james tosland down the pub special uh which uh, part one is going to be out on christmas day so uh you can enjoy that uh with your turkey as well uh, it's well worth a watch uh, and as keith has already alluded to we've got lots more uh, in the pipeline too the lowe's brothers apparently that's new to me uh so looking forward to that um keith any final words before we wrap up for christmas Thanks very much for being with us. I mean, I think that, that obviously, you know, Pete and Crash stay together, um, but we, me and Harry, drifted off to OMG and um, set our own situation up. We appreciate you uh, being with us throughout the year. We appreciate Pete's input as well when he's able to join us. Um, we've got plenty planned for next year. It was all a bit bit of a kick bollock scramble, wasn't it, in August when we decided to set up OMG MotoGP. Um, but we've got a lot of plans for the, for the coming year. But as Ari's already said, if you can subscribe, tick all the boxes that you need to tick, it really does help on the algorithm and gets us back in, in there as well. And the more that, that we, the more viewers that we have, the more content that we can give you for free as it happens. 
<laughs> we're not charging for any of this, which really makes a <laughs> thing for me. <laughs> we might have some merchandise in the new year as well. Oh, uh, yeah. Yes. There might be a little new look coming for OMG. We've done a bit of a rebrand for next year, so have a look at that. Um, but yeah, I reiterate everything Keith said. Pete, thank you so much for all your time. Thank you actually to all of our guests as well who've joined us and given up their time as well. Um, and Amy Reynolds as well, who's come on to, to guest host a couple of shows. Massively appreciated. Uh, them and more will see you in the new year. Have a great christmas or however you spend it uh, and uh, we will see you uh, in 2024 but keep a look out for our james toesland episodes as well on youtube and all the audio platforms uh, but until then have a good one bye-bye see you christmas <laughs>